Yeah, just okay. for a minute. Thanks everyone for being here tonight, this evening, and we're going to stand for our Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all the here, Mr. Connors did me the flav a favor of uh, standing in for him tonight, even though he's here, but you can't see him. But you will hear his voice from time to time. He's uh, remotely joining us. So I am in charge tonight. So we're going to have a little fun. Huh? All right. First of all, I want I have something to read to you. The, the Kennewick School District Board of Directors appreciate hearing from the community. Should I read that now or later? Yes. And because of that, a little bird just told me we're going to read this later. <laughs> right now, we have spe special recognition that we're going to give. Oh, there's the little bird. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Mabry. Well, tonight we have a special recognition of uh, two groups. We're going to start by recognizing the 2023-2024 student board representatives. Uh, this, as the board knows, uh, is our uh, first year of having a student board representative and a representative elect, and uh, both are here officially joining us for the first time. This evening, uh, Mallory Dupaquet is the student board representative and Annie Maltos, Maltos? I wanna make sure I'm saying it right, is our um, student board representative elect. So they're each going to take a couple of minutes to introduce um, themselves to you and the community. So we'll start with Mallory, you can come on up. Hello, my name is Mallory Dupaquet. Um, as you know, I'm the student representative for the board this year. Um, just a few things about me. Um, I've been in this district my entire life, so K through 12. Uh, this year, I'm a senior at Kennewick High, and I'm involved in a various amount of activities over there, such as DECA, um, National Honor Society. I'm also the senior class president for Kennewick High. Um, I also really enjoy playing tennis over there. Um, but more importantly, I just like to note that I feel very privileged to be able to be up here and sit with the board and represent so many intelligent, inspiring and unique students, um, many of which are my dearest friends, family and peers. And I'll be working my hardest this year to ensure that each and every student has a voice and feels heard in the district. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Annie Maltos, and I am the student board representative elect. I'm a junior at Southridge High School, and I moved here about two and a half years ago from Seattle, Washington. So far, I love it here. I'm involved in high school soccer and various clubs at school, such as DECA and FCCLA. My purpose for being here is to make this community welcoming to all children in the Kennewick School District and to make school a fun, innovative place where people can grow as people as well as academically. Thank you. Welcome officially to your first board meeting of the year, and we're glad that you are uh, both here. Our uh, second special recognition this evening is uh, to welcome all of our new administrators to KSD. So we're really fortunate to have hired an excellent, outstanding group of new administrators um, who are here tonight to uh, be recognized. And so I'm gonna start with our new elementary uh, administrators and when I say your name if you could please stand up and uh, wave so uh, we can all see who you are. Um, we'll start with Amber Colhane who's the new Washington Elementary Assistant Principal. <laughs> uh, we've got Kate McConnell who's the new Forza Elementary Assistant Principal. Uh, Jen Veach, uh, who's back <laughs> to the district. Uh, she's the Washington Elementary Principal. And Shelby Ward is uh, the new Ridgeview Assistant Principal. <laughs> oh, and I forgot my fun graphics to show. <laughs> so we've got new administrators at Washington, Fuerza, and Ridgeview Elementary Schools this year. 
Hi, I'm Josh Alexander. I'm using the new assistant. Josh, I so much apologize. I was fussing around with this PowerPoint earlier and, and moving around names, and I somehow deleted yours. So I um, <laughs> thank you, Joshua. And you might show up on the high school slide. Maybe that's where you are. So forgive me for that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and, and Josh is at Hawthorne. Hawthorne. Hawthorne Elementary. Okay, so middle school, hopefully I have not made any further errors, but we've got uh, new administrators at Horse Heaven Hills, Jeremy Fox. <laughs> Jeremy's the new principal at Horse Heaven Hills, and Tanya Kennedy, who is new assistant principal at Horse Heaven Hills. All right, for high schools, we've got a uh, new administrator at uh, Southridge High School, new principal, John Griffith. At uh, Kennewick High School, we've got Kayla Monroe. She's the new assistant principal at Kennewick. And Guy Strott, who is our uh, new principal for Legacy Endeavor Phoenix and JJC. <laughs> Watch the spinning. Okay, so those are the, our new um, high school uh, administrators. And then uh, here at the district office, we've got some new administrators as well. Amy Francis, who's the uh, new assistant director of career and college readiness. Amy. Jared Lind, who's our new director of elementary education. Patricia Mosley, who's our new assistant director of communications and public relations and B.J. Wilson, who is our new director of K-12 Student Services. So, Josh, yes, you were uh, somewhere in, <laughs> in, in, the, in, in this presentation. I apologize again for that. But I um, also just want to give a shout out to um, some of our uh, not new administrators who are here tonight to show their support for our new team members. So if you are a not new, uh, administrator here tonight to show support for your colleagues. Could you please stand up too? Okay. We're really uh, truly fortunate to have um, hired an outstanding new group and of course have an outstanding group of uh, current administrators. We've got a great team this year. Really excited for um, all the you know work ahead and just want to thank you for for being here and for all the work that you do and let you know that you are free to go because you've had a long day so um, we are going to let you scoot on out and uh, appreciate you being here this evening they don't have to go if they don't want to. they don't know you don't have to go but you're free to go <laughs> make your make your book I'll read my little speech. The Kennewick School District, I mean, <coughs> the Kennewick School District Board of Directors appreciate hearing from the community. At regular board meetings, uh, the Board of Directors provide an opportunity for communications from parents, staff, and district residents. This time is reserved during the working meeting for the board to listen to comments, input, and information. The board does not respond, does not respond to comments provided as the goal is to listen and learn. Let the board uh, silence. Please do not let the board's silence uh, present a signal of disagreement or agreement with the remarks. As appropriate, the board would ask the superintendent and her staff to look into any issues raised. Please note, it is important for all community members to feel welcome and safe during the board's business meeting. The board does not take public comments on issues related to personnel, individually named staff members at the board meetings. However, you can email the board with any such comments. And finally, please remember that your words have impact and you, not the school district, are responsible for your words. We caution all speakers that it's possible that your statements could violate the rights of others under various laws. 
including laws protecting privacy, laws pro uh, prohibiting defamation. So if you are unsure of legal effects of your remarks, you should seek independent legal advice. In any case, we ask that you help us model for our students with a respectful and inclusive community look and sounds. Uh, guidelines, a few guidelines for addressing the board, so almost, almost done. Please use the provided form to sign in. You've already done that, I hope. And when the board president calls on your name, please come forward to the uh, podium at the front of the room. You will have two minutes to address the board. And on the screen, it's already there. There's a stoplight that will let you know when to begin, when you have a minute left, and when time has ended. If there are multiple people speaking on the same topic, please focus your comments on aspects of the topic that has not been addressed. Thank you so much time. Thank you so much for spending your time with us this, this evening. All right. So first on our list is Mr. David Cannon. You can come forward, David. How are you doing? Good? I'm doing good. 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 You're nervous? Not that. Good, good. All right, here we go. <laughs> when does the clock start? Now. So about 18 months ago, my wife and I became aware that one of my children had used a school Chromebook to access pornography online. There were over 36,000 individual blocked URLs that had accumulated on his web history. Somehow, with 36,000 opportunities, the Kennewick School District hadn't notified us as parents or hadn't blocked access to his internet during that time. This can be done in 30 minutes. I talked to Ron Cohn. Ron Cohn has similar concerns about the, the access on the internet, the problems with filtering and the reporting. With Ron's blessing, I took my daughter, my 13-year-old daughter's Chromebook, and I decided I would find how lenient this filter was. And I spent half hour researching fantastic and terrifying ways to shoot up a school, commit massive acts of violence and commit suicide and nobody ever reached out to me or my daughter to inform us that this had been done on a school chromebook in the quiet of their bedrooms typing on a keyboard before they have the courage to speak to an adult our youth are having access to information online that the school district will be held accountable for not reporting to the parents there needs to be a reporting tool ron Cohn needs the money and the resources so that parents will be notified first before a student does something inappropriate and harms their self or others. Okay, thank you. So, taking notes on that? Yes. <clears throat> um, so, Mr. Mabry asked me if I was taking notes on it, yes, and I know that uh, Mr. Cannon's been in contact with Mr. Cohn and um, that will continue. I'll provide a follow-up with the board after I have a chance to get some additional information from uh, from Ron Cohn on, on the issue. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. Uh, I do not have anyone else listed. Is there, any, is there Are there anyone else online? No. No? Okay. All right. Okay, uh, can we have a motion to uh, approve consent items? I move to approve consent items as written. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, can we have the roll call vote, please? Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Thunbeck? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Next item is the superintendent report. Is that correct? That is correct. So, uh, thank you. We are off to a great start to our school year this year. And if you've been reading or watching the news, uh, you've hopefully seen a, a number of positive media reports on our new school safety officer program and the expansion of our school resource officer program partnership with. Uh, Kennewick Police Department. So I wanted to provide a little bit of a, an additional update <laughs> to what um, what the media is reporting, which is all great, and just remind the board that it, it's been a little over a year um, ago it, it, 
in August of 2022, I remember uh, being at the active shooter training with KPD. It was at Kamaikan High School. Board members were there. City council members were there. And the question was coming up again about how, how can we get more SROs in schools that don't have SROs? How could we possibly maybe get SROs into our elementary schools? And, um, and one of the challenges that uh, Chief uh, Guerrero, you know, identified at that time was a staffing issue with KPD and just having enough um, fully commissioned police officers to be able to place in schools is a challenge and, and then funding is a challenge because the school resource officer positions are co-funded uh, by the city and, and the district. So um, I know, you know, at that time, I remember specifically all, all board members. I remember um, Gabe and Micah, I believe were at that active shooter training and so was uh, so was Mike. And in fact, I remember Mike called me the, the following day after the active shooter training and and asked about the possibility of hiring retired police officers to put in our elementary schools. Um, he had said a friend of his had shared that idea with him. And, and I remember thinking, wow, that's that's a really good idea. And I wonder if that's something that we could pursue. Um, I then talked with uh, Chief Guerrero um, and he said it was actually after a focus meeting, which don't let me forget to remind you about the focus barbecue later. Um, but uh, he, I said, can, you know, do you have a few minutes so I can talk to you about an idea? And we had a brief conversation and he said, you know, we've been talking about a similar kind of idea. So uh, that then led to a meeting that I had with Chief Guerrero and city manager uh, Marie Mosley. Um, our legal teams did research uh, we discussed it with the board um, at, in depth during a planning session for the levy, if you recall, um, and, and we then built that, the board built the funding for the program into the levy, and fortunately the, the levy passed. And while we're not yet collecting those levy dollars um, until 2024, uh, safety is top priority for us. So we went, you know, right to work after the levy passed to get a plan in place so we could have uh, at least some officers in place by the beginning of this school year, which is what which is what we've done. So uh, Chief Guerrero, uh, Commander Walters, uh, Matt Scott, um, and I met, uh, we brought on uh, Scott Child, who's a former KPD commander and uh, former KSD bus driver after he <laughs> retired after 31 years with the uh, police force. He joined us on the planning team. We worked on job descriptions, plans for equipment, uniforms, radios, training, all of all of the things needed and really got to work on recruiting and hiring uh, our first position. So I'm really pleased to share that we started the year with uh, five school security officers, school safety officers, I'm sorry, I'm using the wrong terminology, school safety officers or SSOs, um, including Scott, um, who we've hired to coordinate the program. So when we're fully hired, we'll have a full-time school safety officer at every elementary school um, and a full-time school safety officer for Legacy in Phoenix. That was what was built into the levy. Um, currently, we have the five assigned to uh, two different schools each so we've got 10 schools currently being covered uh, and then we're continuing to actively recruit and and hire and as new SSOs are onboarded we'll be able to increase the site assignments uh, and then when we're fully staffed uh, Scott will move into the role of full-time safety and security coordinator uh, on the K-12 and KSD team so uh, I just want to again recognize Scott. He's here tonight. Scott, could you stand up for us, please? <laughs> You've seen him all over the media, uh, doing a great job representing the district and the partnership with, with KPD um, and really highlighting uh, the importance of safety in our schools. Um, so we really welcome you to the team, Scott, and uh, you'll be seeing him around, obviously. Um, on the SRO expansion, uh, she, or excuse me, Officer Canada has uh, been assigned Horse Heaven Hills in Chinook. Um, Officer Canada was formerly the DARE officer, so DARE is now also moving into the sixth grade program at our middle schools. And uh, Chief Guerrero indicated that KPD has a number of new recruits uh, 
completing police academy this fall. So that will then enable them to place more senior staff officers into school resource officer positions. So uh, the hope is to have all of the school resource officers for the middle schools, you know, and have them fully staffed in January uh, 2024. So this January. Uh, last night I had the opportunity to uh, be alongside Chief Guerrero as he presented a safety uh, update and update on our partnership um, to, to Kennewick City Council. Um, and so tonight I just you know want to reiterate what what he and I both talked about with City Council last night is that this is a really special uh, partnership. Um, and you know, as a district, we're very appreciative of the the partnership and the programs that we've been able to develop in collaboration with the city and, and with KPD. Um, and we're really proud of the work that we've done to really hit the ground running, you know, and, and get things going this year, even though we're not actually collecting any funding yet. Um, so we're also, I should say, and it, you know, needs to be said and restated. We're really appreciative of the community support of the levy because it's through passing the levy that we have the money to be able to fund the program and uh, and expand the SRO program too. So both the school safety officers and the SRO program expansion. So uh, that's what I wanted to share as my update tonight. I'm happy to answer any questions and I just don't want to forget I mentioned the tailgate <laughs> earlier. So there, there's a focus group that is focused on um, raising funds and uh, focused on ensuring that there's oper drug free and alcohol free safe op violence free opportunities for kids and so annually there's a focused tailgate it's happening this friday starting at 5 30 at lamson it's the southridge kamayakin or kamayakin southridge uh, game and um, everyone is welcome tickets are available uh, it's a nice big barbecue provided by uh, our food services sedexo and it's a great event for families how much are the tickets? Like Four dollars each, but you can get a family, family deal for it's like I think twelve you get, or something. It, it four, four, four for twelve dollars. So it's basically Three? yeah, basically four dollars. Yeah, there's a little bit of a discount for a family. <laughs> how, about for, how about for school board members? You pick up or on? Any questions? Uh, just real quick, so I think I want to highlight on the SSO piece. Um, one, this isn't a position that we're just out to hire and fill, that we have to find the right people. So I just want the community to understand this isn't, we're trying to find the right people for this. This isn't just a rush to fill thing because we want to get people in the, in the schools. Um, and I also think, correct me if I'm wrong, no one else is doing this. So there's no roadmap to how this works. And so as we go, we're kind of creating the roadmap and because I know I've had other board members reach out and like, mm -hmm. how are you guys doing this? Like, this is amazing and, and just. We know it came through the levy and, and the community helped and all that, but just think, be a little patient as we work through some of the. The staffing and stuff, but uh, this is a great program and can't wait for it to be. Ex yeah. Thank expanded, you. Thank so. you for that. And um, just to uh, highlight the part about hiring the, the right people. Uh, that's critically important. Uh, we are hiring people who have um, been through police academy and retired and they've got lots of experience. Uh, policing, as we know, is, um, you know, it's about building relationships. And while they're, you know, they're not police in our schools, they're retired, they're safety officers a big part of their job is building relationships and being that positive presence and interacting positively with students and families. And then, of course, being there um, in in the event that that they're needed. And um, so all of all of them go through, not only have gone through that level of training at some point in their career, um, but when they're hired, they get uh, uh, firearms training through KPD, active shooter training through P KPD. So there's a big partnership with the training um, of of the um, of the safety officers. So it's um, it's a really important role, and we want to make sure that we've got the right people. So I just I want to. It's a great program, no doubt about it. And I'm 100% for it. But I do have have to ask some challenging question, and, and uh, Mr. Charles may be the one to answer, if not yourself. 
Uh, what authority do you have as, as these, uh, these peace officers? What, what authority do they have? Um, I can I can uh, answer that and then Scott if you want to just come up in case there's uh, some things you want to elaborate on that would be great but um, so the, the, these are uh, employees of Kennewick School District um, they are uh, safety officers they have no um, arrest authority or anything like that they are uh, highly trained individuals placed in our schools to keep our students and our staff and our campuses safe so if you want to add anything yeah, to that, just right to the um, mic. Yeah, right to the mic. There we go. A absolutely. I think that's a critical component here is, is number one, we've all come from law enforcement where we had that enforcement arm. So when we showed up, we we're heavy on arrest. We're not doing that now. We are again building relationships. We even now, and I can tell you experience after I've only been doing this for two weeks, I can tell you a ton of stories about the relationships with kids the kids we're building. I work Amistad and Eastgate. A lot of those kids have had not the best experience with police officers for whatever reason when they came in and a parent got arrested this is an opportunity where we can talk to kids um it's it's i feel like i've almost died and gone to heaven because i get to still protect kids and yet i'm not having to go out and arrest people and, and see the bad side of that so absolutely we don't have any authority to arrest we don't have handcuffs on us that's not what we're about we're here for one thing only two things but one one most important thing is protecting our children so if somebody comes onto the campus with an intent to harm them, we're there. And if you really look at the way that we've structured our schools throughout the United States is we've done a pretty good job putting security and police officers in high schools and middle schools, but our most vulnerable have nothing. And when I could, you know, I'm over here at ECAP, if something were to happen, those kids have no idea. So another big component of what we're doing is we're preparing the schools what to do if, if something does happen. Just at my school last week, we got we were on a semi lockdown for a man with a machete running through. OK, and I was right out there. We got the schools locked down and I'm right out there. I can tell you he's not going to get into the school. And so it, that's that's what our mission is, is to protect the kids. It's very simple. We're very engaged from the second we're there. We're helping with traffic. Anything to do with student safety is our priority. And I and I, I can tell you I was teasing with some of my colleagues over there, but I'm it. it, it uh, community has been so receptive to this. I'm not sure they're going to accept it if this doesn't isn't successful. Um, I was just over at Eastgate when they had uh, they have open house tonight and I did the opening remarks and it was literally a, a standing ovation once they realized that what our purpose is why we're there. You know, I almost feel like I'm a firefighter. Everybody loves me now all of a sudden because <laughs> we're, we're there to protect their kids. But that's it. In a it's and what's that? Yes, sir. Well, are you done? I'm sorry. I didn't want to. No, no, down. go ahead. So as a former police officer, um, you also you've you've had lots of training and not just not just like physical training, but also emotional training and, and talking, talking people through things and right. almost like a psychologist in a way. Right. So so I think that's another benefit is is the you know, just the emotional support that you can provide to kids, not just the physical support, but the emotional Absolutely. support as well. And, and then you, and you guys do have training in that and that's something you can lean back on. And then um, the other thing I really like about the program, I just want to throw this out there, is I love the idea that the kids get to see and be around officers and the, the kids see them as the good guys. And, and kids understand that that's the, that's the person that you run to if there's an issue and not run from. And um, so I just love that culture that is, that is hopefully going to build in the future. And uh, so I'm really grateful for that. Thank you. Diana? So one of my little... Uh, student friends is at Amistad and there was a picture of you high-fiving some yeah. kids as they came in and I recognized my little friend and so I saw the family a couple days later and I said oh I saw you high-fiving my friend he goes he looks at me with these big eyes and he goes do you know that man is the president and I said <laughs> uh, you mean the principal and he said no I think he's our president so people think you're very important you are Thank very you. important so you Thank know they you. do look up to you and they do think that you're yeah. just an, another really fun person out there right and it's not scary so I appreciate that and, and it, one of the challenges in law enforcement is you come in normally you make an arrest you're gone no one's there to right. deal with the aftermath and that's just what you said to my point I've had also several interactions with kids that's had poor interactions with law enforcement um, and it's really good to explain to them. Okay, this is what happened. Okay, this is this is something to consider and and listen to them. And so it's nice to have the time to do that. I can tell you, I'm beat tired when I go home <laughs> at night.
from you know just eight hours a day but there's so much going on and you have so many interactions i just i go home and i just crash but it, it's it's a very rewarding thing and and to point i want to thank you I, I think it is critically important that you have the law enforcement component of that we bring them right into advanced training and you're right to your point they all we, we have an opportunity the ones the officers that we're hiring stay in the mic so that the we have it we have an opportunity there. yes we have an opportunity to look at their histories and we're very 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 picky about who we hire and there has been some officers that were qualified that we passed on it's nice to be able to look at someone's 25 to 31 year history and we can we can pretty much say and i always i tease about this i got in trouble for saying this one time but we're not looking for cowboys we're looking for people that got common sense that can use de-escalation be a good role model and that's really what we're building the program on from the ground up and so i thank you for the opportunity uh for all of you this is a great opportunity and again we're this is long overdue and i think we're, we're making our schools a much safer place so learning can take place can someone real quick speak about how we put the SSOs in the elementary, so there was a method to it. It wasn't just yep. randomly picked. So can, can you just highlight that real quick just yes. so the community knows why we're in certain schools? Yeah, we as a team looked at several different criteria, one being structure, one being the, the population size, and then even more importantly was we collaborated with the police department. That's one nice thing about my affiliation with KPD of all those years is, I mean, I've got I've got a lot of context. We looked, we we went around a quarter mile around every school and looked at every police activity calls for service. And then we came up with some type of, uh, these are the schools we selected and why. Um, it's hard because every school should have one, but we had to come up with where are we gonna start? So um, not everybody's super happy, but also we, we at least came and did some of our homework and came up with the schools that we felt were the ones that we should staff first. And the other thing that I failed to talk about, and when you, I heard somebody say earlier, this is revolutionary, the partnership with KPD, this is really a hybrid, even though I work for the school district, this is a hybrid. This is something that has never been done before, ever. And it's, it's this is a full-blown police radio that we have access to. I actually have a King number, and I check into service the whole thing. So in the event of a problem at the school, I pick this thing up and I call and I immediately, I just cut out about three minutes of response time. And every police officer knows that when they hear a King 800, we're King 800, 801, 802, 803, that's our guys are, it's a priority response. So with that alone, my job is to address whatever threat it is. I've got about two and a half minutes and the Calvary's coming. Otherwise we would have to radio the office. They call 911. You got to go through the whole minutia of all that. Valuable seconds are being lost. So. I, I thank KPD for doing this because I've never heard of a law enforcement agency giving the, this type of access to them outside of, of their own, if you will. So huge, huge. Um, yes, I, I do absolutely uh, want to say thanks for doing this, but I do have to ask some hard questions. Ask so, me some so questions. Gonna, but I'm not going to ask you. I'm going to ask our lawyer. Are we covered legally wise and, and liability wise for this position? Uh, yes, we are. The the um, school safety officers or employees of the district are covered under our insurance policies. Okay. We've talked to our insurance company. Okay. Everybody's on board. And so as long as they're acting within the scope of their employment, they are covered. Perfect. And we're covered. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And we're covered under an RCW as well, Revised oh. Code of Washington, that covers that. The schools can actually put armed people in there. So we're very, very much covered. Very good. Appreciate it. Which is another reason why we want to make sure we're hiring the right people. Right. Because right. we have weapons around kids in an event that we, we want to make sure that they know what they're doing. And that's one reason why we put them through a very extensive firearm program okay. to make sure that they're able to do that. And again, we have the history to look to pretty much know what they're going to do based on their history. Well, big advantage. The, keep the communications up. I know you will. I will, but sir. Let us know how we can support you even more. I like Tracy. Uh, I, I will, sir. Uh, maybe come back, maybe in, periodically. And, well, we. And, I would like to rotate some of my officers yeah, through, um, so you get a chance to meet all of them. So I think throughout the year you'll be seeing several different ones. But we will definitely be present here, and uh, we're we're very active out in the schools, and and we're. It's an honor. I view this as an honor. I don't need to work. <laughs> I've got a lot of years in, but to me, to be able to do this to protect our kids, how frustrating it is to see on TV a school shooting, and I think to myself, man, I wish I would have been there. Fantastic. Guess what? I'm here now. Yeah, so perfect. thank you. Thank you all for the support. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Scott.
uh, is ready to give her first official report as student board rep. Mallory. <laughs> <Yay>, <laughs> Uh, so we had our first superintendent um, student advisory council meeting today. Um, I would say it was pretty successful. We went over some key topics that the group discussed last June of what we want to talk about this year. Um, so we just went over that, talked about anything that students wanted to add and which topics students found most important. Um, I believe the students that uh, the topics that they found most important was safety. So this was really good to talk about today. Um, safety um, tying into students feeling um, a student to student respect in school is something that we talked about a lot. Um, we also talked about bathrooms and cleanliness is something that we talked about a lot last year. I'm sure you've heard that repeatedly, repeatedly from London, but still something we can talk about this year and find new ideas. Um, so we just talked about what we wanted to get out of the year. Um, didn't get too far into the topics, but yeah, pretty brief. Good job. You, you're right. You weren't nervous. She, no. Mallory says she's never nervous. So. Mallory, can I ask you a question? When you talked, you said the students talked about safety. Uh, was that physical safety? Was that mostly what they're referring to? Um, I would say it, it depends on the school. So for Southridge, I would say um, they were leaning more into the physical aspect, as well as um, one of our representatives from, I believe, Phoenix was talking about their safety. And um, but it, like I said, it depends on the high school. For Kennewick, um, our representatives didn't find that they were so much worried about physical safety um, as much as um, feeling safe as in respect with their teachers and students. And like a teacher-student relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, know. just feeling safe as in accepted and welcome in the school. Um, but I would say most high schools, um, we're talking about physical safety. Great. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Good job, Alex. Thank you. Thanks, Mallory. Uh, yeah, so. Let's see, over the last couple weeks, I attended somewhere between 12 and 14 open houses. Uh, got to meet a lot of our new staff, talked to a lot of teachers. Uh, it was exciting to see all the kids, especially elementary, that were excited to be back and smiles and, um, you know, going back to their teacher from last year and giving them hugs and high fives and stuff. So um, it was good to be back in the schools again. Um, been out to a couple sporting events recently as well um, so good to see the kids out there and uh, just looking forward to getting the year going and getting out in some some school visits and going from there so Very good uh, micah yeah uh same i've been to um i think that i was actually trying to count it up and i know that uh, i think gabe and i probably went to like 70 percent of those visits together but then he went to a couple and i went to a couple and i think he actually has one more than me and i was gonna visit that what's that small school behind westgate um Q -Aiden. Q -Aiden, yes i was gonna i was go going to visit q -Aiden, and if i'd have done that i would i think i'd be tired with gabe so that's still kind of i gotta get that um yeah I, I really i just love to see the brand new brand 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 new teachers just out of college they're like so excited and so pumped up and it's their 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 rooms are like ready three weeks ago and and all the vets are kind of like just kind of getting it done it's kind of funny and um, um same thing a lot of sporting events saw any play soccer a couple times and um so yeah very productive week i also i also spoke with um a number of board members from across the state um i can tell you people from across the state are, are watching us and they're looking at us i mean i've talked to a couple of two board members from spokane from different boards in spokane from bellingham from stahomish just this last two this these last two weeks asking me questions about things that we're doing and how we're doing things and so i think that we're, we're kind of almost leading the state in a lot of ways and i'm real proud of that very good Diane? So last time I had forgotten my list and I can't find all of it and I'm not going to name all of those, but um, the one that um, Ron talked about before was when we met with Ashwin about um, the student financial literacy and he did contact me another time. That guy, he's like the ever ready rabbit. <laughs> She's like, yeah, 
<laughs> so I he, he just has such an intense passion for this. And so I did a little checking uh, through OSPI and, and through some of my um, legislature friends and th they're they're listening. I mean, we do have curriculum, but they really want to listen to a student voice for that, too. And um, so as State Board of Education is also um, paying attention. Um, to what's coming out of that. And then I spent three days online with the Washington Poison Control or yeah, Control Center um, on harm reduction, overdose prevention and treatment services. And it was adults, but it was also the, the parts that I attended were um, the teen things that were linked to teens. And um, to what Mallory was saying, a lot of the students are, were talking about um, mental health safety and how they felt with other people and uh, screen time and screen things that cause problems and then how um, uh, drugs and overdoses may take part in that too. And so that was very um, heartbreaking, but very interesting to see what we're doing to uh, with our mental health staff to work on that. Uh, Racial Equity and Social Justice Coalition of Tri-Cities monthly meeting. <coughs> Two of the WASDA online networking hours that I was able to go back and look at later because I wasn't available when we met them. And then I've had four um, coffee meetups with uh, four very interesting KSD residents that I, I don't know. I've never met them before and they were just interested in knowing more information about um, the school board races and they just wanted to know who those people were and what, what they were about. So I thought that was nice that they yeah. reached out to know. Very good. And Tri Tech Open House, which is always my favorite. <laughs> All right, Mike, can you hear us? I can hear you fine. I'll be very brief. Uh, I attended the Welcome Back Assembly, uh, which was very well, very well attended. Lots of fun. Uh, Tracy and her team did a wonderful job entertaining everyone there for an hour and a half. <laughs> uh, anyway, the teacher, the teachers were all very excited, so that was lots of fun. Um, also, all further, I, I had a meeting with Ashwin Joshi as well. Uh, brought my wife along, who's also one of our legislators. She was very interested in what he had to say, and, and she's already working on that pretty vigorously. Uh, we also have him uh, put him in contact with the uh, minority ranking member on the Education Committee. So he is going in the right direction. So. Uh, and Diane, I'd like to talk to you about who you, you were speaking with at OSPI. I told, Ashwin asked me about that as well. So I'd like to make sure that we're sure. sending him the right right direction and, and not doing it twice. Uh, and really, finally, I want to just say how excited I am about the SSO program. Uh, and I, I, I would be remiss if I did not give credit to uh, Dave Blosser because this was really his idea. And I just wanted to make sure that he gets the credit for doing this for his concern for our kids and bring it to my attention so we could help uh, bring this to fruition because I think it's a really wonderful program that I'm I'm very, very excited about. That's it. Mike, you were also at the open house at Tritech. Yes, I was. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, I was running around with two of my children who are both enrolled and are absolutely when I mean they're thrilled with it, I mean, they come home and the first thing they do, they tell me every day is the first 10 minutes of their day is, is what they did at TriTech. So they're just, they're, they're, the teachers are wonderful. The kids are excited. They're all learning great things. And so it's a really pleased with what I'm seeing over there. It's, it's they've, again, they've got a nice group of people and a great curriculum. All right, thank you. Uh, I've been working on some legislative policy issues uh if you guys have ideas uh something pressing that now is the time to start discussing them so that they can get on the docket uh and uh, for our legislators or uh, uh, government officials to take a look at and i'm including uh the folks on the federal level also uh this uh, free food uh, free lunches is, is is on a national yeah. level now and so you want to get on touch with your, your federal regula uh, regulators or legislators uh, or your representatives here so that uh, those issues can be addressed. And I'm going to throw up one other issue that's it's down the road a little bit, but it's coming up. Uh, we are moving towards uh, battery operated buses. Uh, those are expensive. And uh, we ne really need to let people know that if we're going to do that, we really need some budget uh, to replace our present fleet 
a move into an EV fleet of buses. That, that's something that uh, I think we're going to hear from in a couple of three, four years as a <laughs> mandate, but the funding it may not fall. So I've said it before, but I'm just, it's one of those things that I think we need to stay on top of. Yeah, question for you. And I was asking Patty or Dr. Pierce if they'd heard, you know how we always get the things that we want to vote on? Right. I yeah. have not received that. That'll come out the next week. Okay. We're going to come up with that list of things and you pick your 10 right. top out of that list. It, it happens next Thursday and Friday. It will come out next uh, this, Well, it'll be developed next Thursday, okay. Thursday and Friday at the General Assembly. Was, was it General Assembly it's Thursday and Friday of next week? Right, but we're supposed to have some idea for voting on that before that. Mm -hmm. I actually put together a spreadsheet of all the stuff that is going to be voted on in General yeah. Assembly, so I can share that with you guys and you can research what you... Yeah, because we that's on there, but yeah. you know, usually we've we, had time we, to talk about yeah. what our top 10 are. So if you wanted to send that out, we can just... Put our top 10 on there you sure. can send it to me if you want to call it yep. and just send it to me and then that will because mm -hmm. usually we have that okay Diane, I, i'm just going to refresh your memory we at, at general assembly we vote on what we want to go forward right. with what then i thought from that <laughs> list you take that this is what we want to take to the state legislators the ten, top 10. we usually have something previous so that we know like yay or nay to vote for you know those kinds of things to so talk about as the legislature uh, rep you didn't get those no okay that's why i was asking yeah because when we go when we go to the assembly and the end of this month well someone's no, some, or this we'll conference, someone's voting for yeah, us yes, as a I, district for 40 some right. things and we should have something that shows what we as right. a board would and, pass well, or do not pass and that's always, happening thursday and friday and next week well, but I have to have that information about what we all want That's to do. That's what I just said. It's happening Thursday and Friday and next week. So you better gather that right. information. I already went and did okay. it. So I'll send it to you. So if you'll just do that. And then can you collate all of that when it comes back? Yep. So if you just want to send it out, we'll send it back. Yep. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, thanks. Because that's what I was asking earlier. Because I looked online and asked and there was nothing okay. yet. So. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. That is all. Oh, Trace is raising her hand. She's got something else. Sorry. One more final thing. All right. uh, I don't want to forget the Shauna, the oh, librarian yeah. at Washington Elementary, has once again provided the board nice. with the 40 book passport, right? So it's the reading log challenge to read 40 books. I'll pass those down. And if you're interested in participating, Do you want to put one in my <laughs> start reading. <laughs> I lost it. Oh, you I, just want to use your own. One one sure. keep, um, I did. Yeah, you know I did. You know it. Oh, wait. I lost. I just took an extra. Diane won last year, folks. By one book or something. I think that's right. Anyway, uh, it's a very fun idea. Hey, if anybody else want to be part of that, I'm sure that we can get people signed oh, up. Oh, she'd be, she'd be happy to have. 40 books. That's not a lie. But tell them what happens at the end. That's the best Oh, part. yeah. You, we were all invited to a party. A party. <coughs> and all the the high reader kids were there. Yeah, and we got to have lunch with them and talk about our favorite books. And it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. So. All right. Thank you. That's good. Okay, next on the docket is our reports and discussions uh, dealing with the strategic, strategic objectives <coughs> for 23-24. So uh, at this time of year, I am coming to the board with the draft strategic obje objectives for the year for your approval. So uh, just as a reminder, uh, we've got a strategic plan as a district. This is that poster version that includes our mission, vision, and strategic goals. And um, those things remain the same each year. Uh, we also have performance indicators and targets that are tied to each goal and the board has expressed interest in wanting to review and refine those this year. This was our fourth year into uh, using this as our model for strategic planning and some of the indicators 
uh, you know, need to be looked at and updated. So uh, at the next board meeting will be your first study session. This year the board decided to schedule quarterly study sessions at 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. prior to the board meeting. And so the topic for that study session will be for uh, you to take a look at our current performance indicators and targets. So, and you have a hard copy of that in front of you. And then you've got an a draft update. So um, kind of based on previous board discussion, I, I've gone ahead and made some suggested edits and also made some formatting changes to the document to make it a little simpler to digest. So you have both copies in front of you. I'll also email them out. Um, so Mr. Connors, you'll get yours uh, electronically. The board's not talking about these tonight, but you're getting these tonight, so you have ample time to review them before you talk about them at the study session on the, I think it's the 27th is our next meeting. But tonight um, is the uh, time to approve the objectives. So each year we um, set objectives or like actual work items that we're going to do that are connected to each goal. Um, those work items are based on data review, needs of the district and board priorities. And then of course the board throughout the year monitors our accomplishment uh, of these strategic objectives through board reports and updates and other means. And then we uh, track our ongoing performance each year um, toward meeting our uh, targets on this annual report document. So uh, just as a couple of reminders in terms of our process for updating the objectives that you're going to see tonight. Uh, we, as you know, each year do an annual uh, student survey, staff survey, family survey. So we look at those results to help inform objectives for the year. We look at our student academic achievement data. Um, that gets reported throughout the year. In fact, tonight, uh, next up, will be a report including our uh, state assessment data and, um, and Dibbles data. So we look at all of that data, including other organizational data from every department, whether it has to do with hiring or has to do with technology or uh, business operations. Um, then we use that data to help inform needs. Uh, we also look at new requirements, new legislation that's come out that we need to uh, act upon. Uh, we seek input from administrators and staff. Uh, we uh, have the board go through the process every year to determine and identify priorities. And so we use your board priorities to help inform our objectives. And then uh, I work with uh, my cabinet team and we take all that information and we develop updated objectives that we present to you. The board approves those and then that kind of uh, cements our work plan for the year. So uh, on the board priorities, I just want to remind uh, the board of the priorities that you identified and you'll see those throughout the objectives. Uh, in uh, At the June retreat each year for the past several years, the board has uh, completed the self-assessment and then looked at the board self-assessment to identify areas of strength and opportunities for growth uh, aligned to the WASDA standards for board governance. And so those are shown on the screen. And this past June, through that process, this is these are the priorities that the board identified. Um, and there's one, two, or a few priorities connected to each uh, standard. So I'll just highlight a couple. I won't um, you know, read them all to you because you've seen these before. But uh, for example, connected to standard one, provide responsible school district governance. One of the identified priorities was to ensure respectful treatment of all individuals, including students, staff, families, community members, and board meet members. And so tonight, later, you're going to uh, see me present a, a civility policy uh, for the board to consider, which is directly connected to this board priority that you've identified. Um, there's obviously a number of other priorities uh, there, including you know ensuring that we're conveying uh, high performance expectations for student behavior attendance and academic performance. Like I said, you're going to see uh, academic performance data in the next presentation and throughout the objectives, you're going to see some specific concrete actions we're taking as a system to help uh, improve our outcomes for kids. 
so with that, just a little context and background, um, I will uh, present to the objectives. <laughs> You've seen these, there are a lot, so I'm clearly not going to you know, read everything here, but I, I will just highlight a couple of areas connected to each strategic goal. So for our goal for all students to be safe, known and valued, uh, the expansion of the school resource officer program in partnership with KPD, the beginning implementation of the school safety officer program, that's all connected to this goal. And so that's uh, work that we're undertaking this year, as you heard. Uh, I wanted to highlight under student voice and value, the expanded engagement efforts with students is something that we're focused on uh, through the student, the superintendent student advisory council, through uh, uh, more engagement with our student board representatives. And I had shared uh, previously um, when the board was talking about potentially a project for the student reps to be involved with uh, that this year we want to conduct some student listening sessions uh, with middle and high school students to really get their <coughs> feedback on uh, on some topics either. Um, and so I want to work with our student board reps, our board and our um, superintendent student advisory council to kind of hone in on what uh, which topics do we think are most needed and um, uh, work with our uh, student board reps to help host those student less listening sessions. Uh, when it comes to our goal for all students uh, to be engaged learners, uh, we're continuing with the providing the online tutoring for all families this year through Varsity Tutoring. That's free to families. Uh, we're using our ESSER funds to help fund that. Uh, also, this is a uh, second one's an example of responding to new legislation. There's new legislation uh, connected to um, identifying students doing universal screening for students at the elementary school to identify um, potential uh, students who qualify for highly capable program. So that's something that we'll be implementing this year. We're also going to hear a little bit more about this uh, when Alyssa presents, but um, in terms of improving outcomes for students, there's really three ways to go about that through curriculum, assessment, and instruction. So on the curriculum side of things, we are conducting curriculum review, instructional materials assessment, and adoption of a new K-5 uh, math materials. And so um, you're going to see some math data tonight that will help show why this is a need for us. Uh, we're also going to be reviewing and updating our district literacy plan and uh, planning for uh, a, a curriculum review for our K-5 ELA program as well. We've got a couple other kind of big program reviews that we're looking at. We want to uh, identify areas of strength in these programs, opportunities for improvement. Uh, that includes our CTE program, career and technical education, and also in our alternative learning programs. Uh, I also wanted just to highlight under the student academic progress and growth, again, connected to the assessment part of curriculum assessment and instruction. Um, we're looking at a pilot study this year comparing uh, the use of STAR assessments and MAP uh, assessments. The board heard about the plans for this in the spring. We're beginning the implementation of that this year to determine uh, which uh, method might be uh, the best method to help provide better information about how our students are doing and provide um, ways for teachers to use that data to inform their instruction. When it comes to our third student focused goal, all students are ready for their future. Uh, we're going to be looking at, we've heard a lot about the um, interest in financial literacy and the um, requirement for the district to implement <coughs> financial literacy standards. So we're going to be looking at the um, potential right, of, uh, of a personal finance graduation requirement. And um, right now, all students are do have the opportunity to take high school personal finance. It's not a requirement, though, so that's something that we're going to be looking at, uh, conducting a review and ultimately making a recommendation to the board around that. And then another one is just interesting I wanted to highlight is um, uh, artificial intelligence. There's there's a lot of uh, discussion right now in the education world about artificial intelligence and how how and whether you know whether and how it should be used in the classroom. And so we're going to be um, delving into that and implementing some policies and guidelines um, for student use and teacher use um, for AI in the classroom. Um, and 
the other uh, kind of policy issue I wanted to highlight here is um, we have a little bit of work to do once we're just waiting for some final guidance from OSPI to implement a new policy that will uh, allow us to award high school elective credit to students for paid work experience. So uh, that's legislation that came out and they're just finalizing some guidelines and then we'll be working to get that implemented. Our family focused goal, all families are key partners. Uh, more uh, work happening here. You're going to hear tonight about expanding family education through Get to Know KSD. So Robin will be presenting on that. And then uh, I wanted to highlight the ensuring family friendly access to district processes, procedures and forms. And part of that has to do with implementing our um, language access policy and procedure that ensures that families um, receive information in their the language that they speak and that um, is is best for them. When it comes to our staff focused goal for all staff members to be safe, respected and valued professionals, a couple of things I wanted to highlight here. We're continuing to build our recruiting Washington teacher uh, program. Uh, that's our kind of grow your own program, CTE program to um, help foster and encourage students who are interested in going into education careers to have that opportunity in high school and then uh, have a bridge to, to college. So we were able to get the teaching bridge program going last year, our CTE staff and working with uh, WSU. And we've got students who are um, now uh, graduated starting in WSU and, and able to work with us as paraeducators while they're earning their teacher certification. So that's a great program. We're going to continue working on that. Uh, on the instruction side of curriculum assessment and instruction when it comes to improving out from outcomes for kids, Last board meeting, I, I talked a little bit about our p focus on professional learning communities and the, the research and data that shows that collective teacher <coughs> efficacy uh, makes is, is one of the things that can make a, a big difference in student learning. So this year we're expanding our training and time uh, to support PLCs focused on teacher collaboration on standards aligned learning assessment, data analysis, intervention and enrichment uh, to support classroom goals and eventually improve student outcomes. So that's a focus for us this year when it comes to staff. Uh, two more goals here when it comes to our community focused goal. Um, we've got uh, a lot of good good work and partnerships uh, continuing. Um, here you'll see that uh, board priority show up on the objectives in terms of that culture of belonging, dignity, um, respectful treatment for all. So the civility policy that you're going to see later, <coughs> you know, one one concrete thing. There will be more things that we can work on there. And then I wanted to highlight because I know volunteering and having volunteers in schools is an important priority for the board. Uh, we are going to be investigating an electronic system for volunteer screening and tracking uh, to make it a little bit easier, uh, the process is easier and also easier for us to get the data that really gives us accurate information about um, the level of volunteering in our schools. So we, we don't have that electronic system right now, but we're going to be looking into that this year. Finally, uh, with our district focus goal for our district to be innovative, proactive and accountable, uh, Ridgeview will be completed this year. It should be uh, ready for move in at the end of December. So um, that's exciting. And um, we're also going to be, as you know, the board uh, approved the boundary, the new boundary for implementation in the 24-25 school year. So we'll be preparing to implement that new updated boundary this year to take effect next year. And then um, again, just on a, the policy side of things, uh, this is the year for the 3000 series. <laughs> so um, we'll be reviewing and updating the 3000 series of board policies this year to ensure everything is up to date and consistent with uh, good best practice and with the law. So those are just some highlights of a lot of work that we have to do <laughs> this year. So my recommendation uh, is that the board approves the 23-24 strategic objectives and uh, then the, if uh, the next steps will be at that study session right for the board to look at the key performance indicators and targets 
and then I can get those updated and brought back to you at the October 11th meeting so you can approve those and then we'll get the full updated 23-24 strategic plan published. There's actually one thing that I think that we might want to think about, maybe not for this, but for the next one is um, looking at the middle school boundaries and just kind of I think that's something that we ought to be thinking about a little bit, maybe at least look at it. Or... Okay. And, and you know, just um, appreciate you saying that. And, you know, there's always a dish, other work that emerges through the year. Of course. So, yeah. Um, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, did I hear you when you said on PLCs expanding training and time? Y yes. However, what I meant okay. <laughs> by that, so I mean, we just say that, yeah. Look, what, we're, what we're wanting to help buildings is look at what time is currently available and, you know, how can we maximize the time that, that we have. So we've got the early release um, on Wednesdays. Um, some buildings have been able to structure um, common planning time and those sorts of things. So we don't have necessarily like additional time to give, <laughs> but we want to help people um, look at possibilities for maximizing time for that collaboration to occur. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, varsity tutors, so I just wanted to highlight real quick. Um, I, when I did the orientations, I met with th three different people from varsity tutors. They're a fantastic partner. I just want to highlight that it is free up to two hours a week. We have work to do on learning loss. So parents, it is free two hours a week. That could be 40 to 50 hours during the school year that your student or child could be getting free tutoring and teachers. That's an access that you have that you can work with parents if a student needs help. Use it, please. Let's we need to max this out. And I will say the caveat for that is the child doesn't have to be behind. It is for all students. Correct. So if I'm a senior and I've got a class that's an AP class, like go for it. You know, get yeah. get that information out there. So it's for all students. Yep. All right, so we have a recommendation. Does someone want to put that in a form of a motion for approval? I move to approve the 23-24 strategic objectives for first and second reading. All right, we have a motion. Are there questions, concerns, discussion? Oh, no, I need a second. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll second. Okay. Okay. Questions? See none, hear none. We are ready for the roll call vote. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Now, I see Mrs. St. Ed moving slowly toward the podium. <laughs> I'm assuming that oh. she's next, and she's going to help us with student <laughs> growth and proficiency targets. Is that correct? Yep. Give me just one second. All right, well, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here to, with you tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about our K-12 annual student goal report. Uh, this is connected to that strategic plan goal that our students are engaged learners. Um, this report tonight is going to show where we're making progress, um, not just um, proficiency and making grade level standards, but also that our students are making growth um, each year. Um, so for tonight, I'm going to just review with the board our reporting calendar. We look at a lot of different types of data, um, and tonight we're going to focus on three specific assessments. Um, and then we're going to get into some elementary data, some middle school data, and then how we're uh, responding because we always want to be doing better. Um, at the end of the presentation, we have school level data that you can review if, if you'd like. Um, so we spread our different pieces of data out to share and report to the board throughout the year. Um, so tonight, 
Um, for September, we're going to be looking at our state assessment, the Smarter Balance Assessment. That's an assessment for reading or ELA um, and math. We're also going to be looking at WIDA, which is an assessment for uh, English language development or acquisition. And then for our kinders, first and seconds, we're going to be looking at some Dibbles data. This is um, data that really helps us understand how our students are learning how to read. So let's get into it. Let's see. We are going to spend time at really looking at growth, that all students are growing from when they start with us till we assess them at the end, that all students are growing. Um, and then we also want to be looking at how our students are doing meeting those grade level standards and expectations. So as I've mentioned, we look at lots of different types of data points to see how we're preparing our students for their futures. Um, and tonight we'll be focusing mainly on these three assessments. So in um, kinder, first and second, we look really closely at those early literacy skills that our students are learning how to read um, and also some language acquisition pieces. In grades three through eight, we look at our smarter balance assessments. Um, in ELA and math. And then we're also going to look at WIDA tonight, which is an assessment that's given to students K-12, um, depending on how many years they've been learning um, in the English language with us. Um, Dr. Pierce shared earlier that we have all of these um, targets in a document. It, this is what it looks like, but I'm going to present it just a little bit different tonight. So we're going to start with um, Dibble's um, data from last year. So this is for the whole school year, and it's um, very high level. It's the whole district together. Um, so for um, our growth goal, we want to make sure our students, at least um, half or more, are moving from intensive to strategic or strategic to be benchmark. And we are able to capture the last three years of how our students are doing. You can see there's some growth in kindergarten. Um, uh, first grade stayed the same as last year. And then we have a little dip down in second grade that we want to look into and make sure that we respond to. I'm just moving right along. Uh, we're going to look at our Smarter Balance data for fifth grade. Um, and this is for reading and math. This, this one, this slide is growth. So students who are making growth from the year previous to this year in Smarter Balance. You can see that um, for fifth grade, we are down in reading from last year. Um, and we're also down in math from last year in the growth. If you look at proficiency, we, we hung on from last year. It's the same as last year as um, being on grade level. I'm going to keep moving into middle school um, for these assessments. Again, back to growth, students who are gaining and learning more. For, so in sixth grade, we're down in growth in both reading and math. In seventh grade, we're down a little in reading and we're down in math. And then in eighth grade, we're down in reading and we, we held in math as far as growth goes looking at being on grade level or being proficient, um, we're up in sixth grade reading and math. We're th the same and up in reading and math in seventh grade from the previous <coughs> year. And then in eighth grade, uh, we took a little dip down in reading and we're up a little bit in math. Up and down, up and down. Uh, last year, Dr. Pierce um, showed us some data at this time, like where are we at from before COVID? So I just want to kind of walk through this um, with you. So if we look over here in spring of 2019, um, we have where we were as a district, and this is whole district um, taking smarter balance assessment. And then at 2020 spring, we didn't have any assessments. When we came back in the fall, we tested. And you can see quite a quite a dip there um, in the fall. We then tested in the spring, and we're back up um, to. Let's see, I'll use the mouse here. So we we've moved back up a little bit in spring for both of those, 
and then we had another year. So this was this um, last spring test and we're down just a little bit in ELA and we're up a little bit in math. So if we if we think about where we are from before or pre COVID, we um, we were down this much. Two school years ago, so 21 22, we made a gain. And then this last school year that we just finished up, we didn't we didn't continue to accelerate. We, we dipped just a little bit in ELA, but we did continue to gain a little bit in math. So we, we still aren't there. We're still not back to our pre COVID levels. We still have some recovery. Tutoring's one option. I'm going to talk about a few other options that we're looking at right now. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that clearly shows that Zoom school is not working for our kids. I mean, the the decrease we had while we were stuck in Zoom school to now trying to make that back up. It's and it's not just going to recover yeah. like that either. Yeah, we've got work to do. Can I, after, can I ask a question after I guess you're crazy. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> Ron, you're the man tonight, remember? I also um, just wanted to highlight, uh, and it's, uh, you know, th there was a, an article in the Tri-City Herald, and it's what I said to the reporter. Um, our goal isn't to get to where we were pre-COVID, because where we were pre-COVID is not where we want to be. Um, we want to be better than that. So I just think that that's important just to highlight that, yes, that's actual data, but we're just not striving to get to where we were pre-COVID. Your, in your opinion, um, the decline in the, in the growth what would you attribute that to? I'm going to talk about that. In oh, a look at this. I'm giving you a segue. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Because um, we, I, I look more at the growth than proficiency. To me, it's important that all kids are leaving here better than when they start at the beginning of the year. Sure. So uh, that one to me is personal. <laughs> um, I want to make sure we're doing the best for every single kid. So that some of that data, we've got to do better. Before I do answer that, though, I have a little bit about our um, language, our multilingual learners um, and how we're doing on WIDA assessment. This is the state assessment, it's a required assessment to show um, how our students are doing at learning the English language. May I ask you to expound upon the acronym? WIDA. I, yes, you can. It, it actually is just WIDA now. It used to be something else, um, but now it's just WIDA. Um, it comes out of Wisconsin. Um, it used to be world class instructional design and assessment. Um, it's a professional, it's a consortium for language acquisition. Okay, so it, 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 it's not an acronym thing. Not anymore. It's just WIDA. Um, okay. We used to have ELPA. The English language proficiency assessment. Before that, we had WELPA, the Washington English language proficiency assessment, WLPT. I'm doing a little um, uh, mentioning the past a little bit. But WIDA is um, a national, like Smarter Balance, WIDA is a language assessment. And it comes with a lot of good support and um, data analysis support. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so for our multilingual learners, we can't really look at it by grade level. We want to look at it from years in program and we've set growth targets based on how long a student has been um, learning with us. So if a student's here less than a year in program, um, that could be a kindergartner, fifth grader. It just depends on where, where they are as a multilingual learner. Um, we want to make sure they're growing. Um, and we've got a target that 85% of them are making that growth um, target. Um, we came in at 76% um, for this last year. Um, as students are learning language, it gets harder to learn more language. Um, so those numbers, are, it's hard to stay that high all the time. Um, but we really want students at a proficiency level in that fourth, fifth year, um, if possible. Um, if they can be proficient on the WIDA, they're going to be proficient on the Smarter Balance Assessment. Um, so we, we are tracking it with the number of years in program. And then we are also tracking proficiency. Um, we want fit at least 15% of our multilingual learners 
exiting or successfully um, being proficient on that WIDA assessment in six years or less. Um, and this last year we were at a 4% for that. So we always are striving, as Dr. Pierce said, to do better and we have a mindset of continuously improving. Um, our new annual objectives do point out some different key areas that we want to look at and I'm going to highlight just a little bit more um, in those areas that were mentioned in the previous presentation about curriculum assessment and instruction. This is how we improve outcomes. We have to work at all three simultaneously. They go together. Um, so as mentioned, we were looking at our K-5 math um, instructional materials because we feel we need um, strong materials for our teachers for math. And so we had our first large meeting yesterday for our math adoption. We had about 60 elementary teachers here starting to get into that process of reviewing materials. Um, we're looking at our literacy plan and making sure it is grounded in research and making sure we have best strategies to be teaching literacy um, to our students. And we're going to be updating that this year and have an updated plan by the end of the year. And then this is the really big one, back to your point, Mr. Valentine. We are doing a lot of work making sure we're teaching the right standards and that our teachers know what the standards are at their grade level. Um, that goes along with our professional learning community work as well. Um, but when our teachers um, know the standards, know how to break them down for the students, um, that, that can be a turning point for our learning and making sure we're preparing them for those assessments. So you're saying standards, how you measure, measuring <laughs> consistently, you think that's one of the keys to not having a dip in the growth? Well, knowing the standards and then how are we doing having progress monitoring, looking at how we're doing, being student focused on the results and making sure that if um, students aren't responding, that we're making adjustments and changing um, how, how we're teaching and instructing, regrouping students using different strategies, using different materials. So it's, it's a con, you've got it, yes, you're looking at the standards and how we're doing on them. Well, that, that's how you're going, that's how you, that's how you plan to improve, which I like that. Mm -hmm. I was wondering why you think there has been a, a dip or, or why uh, the growth has, has declined. So is that because we haven't been doing those as well or we're just, or, you know, or? Well, I, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> I think looking at um, the math, <clears throat> like we need to have some different materials ready for our um, teachers. What's interesting too, and, and you'll see the data in the appendix, we don't go through all of that, but you know, we're, we're presenting the data at a really high level tonight, kind of, you know, aggregated up whole district, all, sure. all grade levels, or in some data points, it's every student who tested at every grade level. We also look at the data and engage with our schools, our school, right, yep. and looking mm -hmm. at by school, by grade level, by teacher team, and it's really interesting because you see patterns. There's some schools and uh, grade levels that are are seeing high levels of yeah. growth. We have um, some great so things going we, on. Yeah, what mm -hmm. we what we do is when we look at the data, we look and we identify, you know, wh where do we need to grow, but we also identify where are those outlier spots where we're seeing growth and we're seeing higher levels of proficiency and then we're connecting with those schools and teacher teams to find out why and one thing that we're finding that's in common is they have strong professional learning community that's what work ask, happening yeah. which is exactly what we're so seeing you, so that was, that was my next question mm -hmm. is do you you do feel like that is a big difference that when they have those those professional plc right when they have those plcs established yeah, in fact, you know, um, those of you, and again, I'll take this opportunity to apologize to Micah for not recognizing him at the welcome back because I didn't see that you were there. Mr. Connors was there, uh, Mr. Mabry was there, and, and, and Mr. Valentine was there too. And uh, during the welcome back, we, we get to, you know, recognize schools for um, meeting growth targets or proficiency targets in all kinds of ways, um, school culture and academics. And we highlighted a couple of teacher teams mm -hmm. um, in the videos where they're they're seeing tangible results because of their PLC work. Hmm. And I, I'll add to it's when PLCs are done right. 
So they have to be focused on student learning. There have to be high levels of collaboration. And that's, and that's your job, right? To make sure that you're communicating how they're doing. They are. And our principals, like it, it takes all of us to do that. And but that's where the training's coming in. Yeah, for sure. Matt Scott's on it. Yeah, um, we are a team. We're all working on it. Um, I will add with assessments as well, we are um, increasing the use of the Smarter Balance interim assessments. This is an area we can do better in, and those are kind of like the pre-tests and help teachers get, help students get used to what's going to be coming up on the Smarter Balance um, assessment, get used to the format, and then also um, look and see how the students did on that, um, do some teaching, some reteaching, and, and it will help them on those assessments. Jane, so um, I want to ask about the adoption for math or ELA when we get there. Mm -hmm. Because you worked in federal projects before, mm -hmm. there were times that um, our multi-language learners were not getting, we had a one-size-fits-all and it doesn't always one-size-fits-all. So what's happening to make sure that the new curriculum that we are looking at and then eventually choose work for everybody. Yeah, so we've got great representation on our committees to make sure that we have all of those um, perspectives in the room to look and see are the materials um, good for our special education students, good for our multilingual learners. Um, but not just that, uh, the materials, um, it's really those inclusionary practices um, and giving support in inclusionary practice. So all kids are in core <coughs> content, core instruction as much as possible with the right support so it's comprehensible. So important. Um, I clicked on what was under instruction. I feel like we've kind of already hit them. Um, so I'm gonna keep on moving, um, which is um, just to open it up to more questions. Is is the uh, SBA test, is that strictly given in English? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you have- well, so you, Let me clarify okay. that. There are, um, we can put in permissions for students. So there's some translation and some stacking that happens so they can um, see, their language that they're most familiar with. So there are a few supports. The students have to know how to use those supports. Uh, so, so our students, what, like our ELL students or whatever, first year, they don't know any English or barely any. They're taking an English test and expected to succeed at the English level. Yes. Well, that seems kind of silly to, to me personally, but yeah. um, and there's not a way to get the state's aware like. of it. Um, it's a challenge as well. Um, and and we know it, like our teachers know, like to look at that data um, and know that there's other pieces to be looking at. Um, we, for those multilingual learners, we really want to look after three, four, five years. Yeah, you, it just seems you, when you look at a school and they're significantly lower and you know they're ELL learners make right. up a majority of the school, the, the states just seem yeah. to be dragging their feet on being able to put this in multiple languages so the kids can actually test, right? Because it seems mm -hmm. kind of odd to me that we would make them take tests in English when they don't read or write mm -hmm. English. Yeah. One thing I think that you're highlighting is the importance of understanding, you know, what do these, what, what does this data mean? This data doesn't show like what schools are good and what schools are bad or what schools have kids that are learning or what schools don't. It, it's, it tells us information about individual students and what they are able to do at this point in time mm -hmm. and helps us as a system go, okay, so what do we need to do to, to provide? But I think you're right. A lot of times people just look at the test scores and go, oh, that's that school must not be as good as that other school mm -hmm. because they're seeing it as a kind of a pass fail or some sort of grade about the school and that's not what it is at all. And so I think that that's a really important uh, point that it, you know we should all be using the data to, to go, okay, what, what, are, what, what is this information telling us about what our students can do at this point in time? And what do we need to do to help them? Because ultimately we do want our multilingual learners to yeah. be able to 
read and write at grade level. Mm -hmm. They can't yet if they if they don't know English. And so that's why we've got to get them into program and things like that. So if we don't use the data in a punitive way or mm -hmm. in a like a judging or putting schools into categories of good and bad, then I then I think it's OK. But I might I you know, I think that you're right. That's the kind of tendency. It creates an looking, unfair perception of the school yeah. that this, mm -hmm. the school's not having kids at grade level right. proficiency when right. yet there's there's a, a deeper story to that and it just it's another nice reason why we look so closely at the feet. growth as well because those students do make great growth yep. and that that is a celebration that we can see thank you any other questions comments thank you so much so thank you very thank much you. <clears throat> So, Robin, you're going to give us some information tonight? Get to know the KSD plans? <laughs> That's right. All right. <clears throat> Here we go. I'm excited to present to the school board some information about our plan this year for Get to Know KSD. Um, so our goal this year with KSD, it's a little bit different. We definitely worked on refining what we're working on based on not only the school board feedback, but also feedback from our families. We really want to we want Get to Know KSD to engage, empower, and educate our families in their child's ex education experience. So um, we're going to, we have a family hub right now. It's not uh, necessarily a useful tool for families, but we want to um, take what we currently have and build it out to be a pretty useful resource for um, our families. So we want them to be able to access tutoring um, from this, this hub that we're going to create and maximize and train our families on how to get the most out of Parent Square, um, navigating PowerSchool through accessing grades, attendance reports, and then using technology tools to support student learning. Um, for example, how to use Schoology for your child's educational experience. And then also help with homework, um, our tutoring program, for example, and how to get extra help there. Um, accessing school information between multiple households, um, if you have multiple family members who need to get communication. And then updating uh, family contact information. These are just examples of what you might find there. It's not to, meant to be like an inclusive, uh, totally inclusive list. Um, I think there is a lot of opportunity to expand um, and put it into a format that's easily for easy for families to digest. And then um, we're also going to provide some online parent information and education sessions about volunteering in schools, accessing information in your language, um, keeping students safe online, using technology tools, um, for example, AI or ChatGPT, and um, some best practices there. And then learning the latest in high school requirements, pathways, and college and credit opportunities. And as we know, this could be its own, its own section. Um, and then creating sex, successful readers and engaging children in math and giving them some resources and tools to help their children at home when they're able to. So the timeline, we're looking to start organizing, kind of take a, a really an evaluation of what we currently have or maybe redoing some of our existing resources to bring them up to date um, by auditing our existing resources that we have there. And then um, there might be some resources even with our IT department that they already have that we can integrate as well. And then the next phase would be January through March, creating content for volunteering and language access and adding that to our hub. And then in March through June, we'd be creating content for online safety technology tools, high school updates, reading and math um, to complete the year. Does our school board have any questions or comments? 
like um, that picture. <laughs> I, I like the kid. He's just comes, so cute. I, like I the, couldn't resist. I like the kid that says, Kate, in the commercials. Is that one of these kids? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? That, that kid that says, KSD, he got his, you know. Oh, the little guy. It's the it, cutest little yeah. voice that says. <laughs> really? Something about KSD. I might know that. Get to know KSD. I might know that. Like that cute KSD oh, voice. Oh, your daughter. <laughs> OK. Good job if you know. You can pass that She's on. just as cute in yes, person she as she is <laughs> on the radio. Yes, thanks. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, you know, during COVID, you had some similar things where we had videos for parents in multiple languages, how to do Schoology, how to do all those different things. And that was very helpful for parents because they'd never seen that at that time. And things have changed, though, even though it still may be Schoology, it's changed dramatically. And so these are the kind of things that, you know, parents really, I'm sure you get calls all the time. IT gets calls, I know, about how do I get to this <coughs> thing? So I think, you know, thank you for doing that because I think that's really what meets so many of our parents' needs, but students' needs too, because when parents know how to help, then it works better for everybody. So thanks for making a whole different thought process. And then I wouldn't be the only one coming to your great meetings that everybody has <laughs> planned and done such good work for, and everybody can see it online when they need it. I think yeah. that's the important access piece to that. We will miss you, Val. I still come. I'll still be here. Real quick, real quick. Is, so is the hub, will that be just on the KSD webpage? There'll be some yeah. link to it and it'll go that, so, that we're up. So in our communications <laughs> department, what we can do is we can push out those resources. So it is a centralized, more visible location than it is right now. Um, but uh, it's it is gonna be a great tool for us to build resources. And I have some ideas about expanding our newsletters um, to have a family focused like a family hub newsletter um, that's just for families um, we have the good the good stuff which is really great news for our entire community but there's also things that wouldn't apply to our entire community that are really family focused um, and it would be those tools and resources that they would find in that hub section so we're we're, we're diving in on the work already and um, hopefully we'll exceed the expectations that were set forth in our plan. So did I miss this? I mean, you, you might have said this and I'm sorry, I apologize if I missed it. Like, if this is, you're getting this ready, right? It's, it's okay, and then when do you say, when will it be ready? I, you might have said that. So it's, it's a, a phased, oh. yes, okay. okay? Yes. But as we have resources ready, we'll start pushing them out. Okay. I'm hopeful that you'll see it sooner than later. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is it is okay, Tracy, if we take a short break? A two minute, five minute break? You like it. Yeah. Whatever you, you get to be the decision. decision. You're the decision maker. the boss man, Ron. All right. Sorry, Pete, but I got to do this.
All right, we're going to uh, call it back to order. And Tracy's going to take us to policy number 2314, use of outside media sources. Okay, so this is uh, unfinished business coming back to um, the policy revisions pertaining to uh, use of uh, movies um, in the classroom. And so uh, this was discussed at the last board meeting and now it's coming back in the strike through underlying version for the board to consider. So what you'll see is uh, the revision would be that uh, elementary students in grades K2 instead of K5 um, would be only shown G rated films. PG rated films may be shown to students in grades 3 through 12 instead of 6 through 12. Uh, and then the other addition is that all movies, regardless of rating, shown to students must be uh, uh, previewed completely, approved by the principal, and permission must be received prior to showing. So then that same language also uh, is for the, um, the, or the same like K2 language pertains to the TV ratings too, right. and 312. All right, uh, do we have a motion to approve 2314 as presented? I move to approve policy 2314 use of outside media resources in the classroom for first and second reading as written. I second. All right, we have a motion and a second open for discussion. Seeing none, hearing none, I call for the roll call vote. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunbit? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. All right. Next on the docket is uh, policy 2235. That's Matt talking about transition to kindergarten. Yes, good evening. Um, so we are going to bring policy. This is new policy language for you in regards to transition to kindergarten program. The transition to kindergarten program, just to remind you, is a legislatively established and authorized program for children who are at least four years of age by August 31st, who have been identified through a screening process to need additional preparation to be successful in kindergarten um, the, the following year. So um, OSPI has published data that indicates that to be a successful ki kindergarten student um, transitional kindergarten is, is very effective strategy for doing that. Um, and over the course of this last legislative period, House Bill 1550 was passed, which established uh, emergency rules um, for the 23-24 school year, and then they're going to be finalizing some rules. And so one of the things that WASDA did was they established this policy as being essential, essential policy for districts, um, even though we will probably need to come back with some policy revision after those emergency rules are, are ratified. In terms of this policy, as you look down through it, um, proposed policy 2235 um, really establishes a few things. It addresses first the district commitment to serving eligible students. Um, it, it reflects flexibility, both in program location and the use of best practices. Um, it, establish, it ensures that we're gonna have screening processes and tools to use to measure ability and the need um, for, for students. It also outlines the age requirements and establishes priorities and, and protections for students with disabilities because we don't want those students to be excluded based on a disability or disabling condition and also guarantees the program is free to our, our for, for those students. Um, just by way of information, we currently utilize our ECAP waiting list and ECAP screening procedures. So this policy is right in line with what we're currently doing. And we're also just for by way of information, starting the program this year. Um, at, right after Thanksgiving, which is a little bit more than a month sooner than we started it the previous year. Um, every year we move it up a little bit because it is so effective for those kids. Um, so I bring this, this brand new policy language to you um, for consideration. All right, do we have a motion? I would entertain a motion. <laughs> I move to approve policy 2235 for first and second reading. As presented? As presented. A second. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Open for discussion. Yes. Sorry. So it talks about um, 
using one or more instruments or methods of assessing and measuring? Is that a statewide or are we using our own district or ECAP measurements? Um, so that is locally determined. Okay. Um, they, there were some changes in the emergency rules about right. that. Um, so they, so again, we feel like we are using using our our established procedures, the screening procedures are going to work. That may change when they when they create more permanent rules. And we'll, that's we'll that's kind of why it. I asked to see if they've given you any information at mm -hmm. all yet about that. No. Okay. Did you have any? No, I was just waiting. <laughs> okay. Just, just real quick, would, would something like this serve as having a, um, I know in some policies we have procedures, would something like this, like the eligibility piece down, would that be more procedural where, where it can be updated as needed without the continued use or bringing back to the board to update the policy? Like, I'm just wondering if maybe the policy is the first paragraph and then the rest is a, a procedure. Yeah, and it, I, I kind of looked at it in the same way, but I think when we're talking about things such as screening processes, the procedures allow us to outline what those processes will be. Fairly certain that they're not going to be changing the requirements of being four, year old, four years old by August 31st. So I think that, again, these things are probably not going to change, but the how we do it would be reflected in that procedure. Okay. Um, I had somewhat the same thought as I looked through it, but I, I think it's it's good policy. Okay. Yes. And I would just add to that the... Um, they didn't provide a model procedure and so I wondered too if it's because of the emergency rules and so maybe once they finalize the permanent rules we'll be able to better separate policy and procedure yeah. language. Yeah, I think it was when we were talking with Senator Wellman but I could be wrong on which one it was. Um, there were some people who didn't agree and there were some funding issues and do you remember all mm -hmm. of the big mess on that <laughs> and um, they weren't able to get enough information in time so that, do you remember that being somewhat similar i know we talked about it in the lots of meetings and so this year is supposed to be gathering information that they should have had last year so we will probably have to play catch up after they spend time doing that all right Discussion and I'll open it for roll call vote. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunbit? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> now we have a discussion on collective bargaining policy 5020. Dr. Tracy Pierce. Back to me. Okay. And uh, Bronson Brown's also here this evening in case there are uh, any clarifying questions. He was also here when the policy was originally um, developed by the board. So, uh, so uh, policy 5020 uh, outlines the board's uh, strong belief in the concept of transparent government and desire to have uh, open bargaining and also acknowledges that uh, by open bargaining they mean uh, having bargaining sessions between the district and labor unions um, open to observation by members of the public and the current policy also acknowledges that that can only be done um, if it's agreed upon if the if the union agrees to it um, so that's been in place for a number of years and um, the current policy though also says that all documents exchanged um, in a, like traditional bargaining session would be posted to the district website. So that has been current practice for a number of years since this policy was originally established. However, a recent PERC ruling um, has, has identified that as an unfair labor practice unless the, the union agrees to it. So uh, that means uh, we need to update board policy to reflect that. So what you'll see um, is the, you know, the spirit of the policy, language remains intact, but um, it, it clarifies that the opening of bargaining sessions to members of the public and the documents being exchanged are subject to agreement by both parties. Um, that both sides must be willing to participate in that open bargaining um, and directs 
this administration to proceed with closed bargaining should any uh, bargaining group you know not want to participate in that open bargaining or which includes the now the posting of exchange documents now the board also knows that you know as as a board um, you are uh, privy uh, to all of the information as elected officials right uh, about bargaining and and it's uh, legal for us to to meet um, and provide information to you um, outside of an executive session it's not a posted meeting so there's there's no way for the district staff really to do anything without the board's uh, knowledge or authority and the <coughs> board's representing the public right in this whole process so I just want to highlight that as well um, you know we've been successfully bargaining uh, contracts and the board's been uh, kept you know informed and so uh, we're just updating the policy to conform with the perk ruling and and the law and to avoid unfair labor practices and I'm just going to uh, ask Bronson to clarify anything uh, or highlight anything that I didn't mention that I should have <laughs> Sure. Just, just briefly, um, when this policy was put in place, the uh, that perk ruling didn't apply, and there were several districts that were uh, posting um, documents to their websites, and uh, that was perfectly legal. But this perk ruling, and, and this perk ruling. Um, there's a series of cases over the last couple of years where this has kind of been developing essentially that they said that the uh, school board does not have the authority to set ground rules for bargaining unilaterally it has to have, you have to have consent of both the union and the school district so this is where we're at okay Probably want to entertain a motion and then questions. Okay, anyone want to entertain a motion? I, I move to approve policy 5020 collective bargaining as written. First and second reading. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Are there any discussion? Yes. Uh, so Bronson, and maybe I need some history on this. So based on reading this, my understanding is from now past the board's direction or the board's been completely willing to do open negotiations post the back and forth whatnot but if the union says no then it's closed so our 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 history our stance has always been yep we're willing to do it but the union has not okayed that and so we haven't been able to do public bargaining That's correct and based on this <laughs> policy the board is saying, hey, we want open negotiations, we want documents exchanged, we want to open the public. But this policy says, but we realize we have to have consent of, of the union to do it too. So, okay. Why wouldn't the union want to help? You speak, a, a, I just want to clarify um, and, and make sure that, um, so current, currently, like we've, we've not had anyone any uh, bargaining unit consent to opening um, meetings for public observation and that, because that was the definition right of open bargaining but the current policy said that we could that, that basically directed the district to post exchange documents regardless of whether you know the union agreed to it or not it wasn't discussed as part of the bargain so we have in recent history um, had bargains that were not open to public observation, but the but the ex, the documents were being posted online. But now the perk ruling is saying you can't do that unless consent's given. Like we didn't, it wasn't consent wasn't discussed previously with the with the unions on that, because the policy said you need to do that. Am I making sense? And is that and that consistent policy was put what? in place in uh, 2019? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to understand because I know I know this has been a big topic and and it seems like as a board, as a district, we're all for opening the door and letting people in and transparent and all this stuff. But it's two way street. So at the end of the day, the union's the one closing the door. If we're open to it and we're saying let's do it, then 
and the union doesn't agree to it, then we're, then we're behind the closed door. So we, district board, are all, all for that transparency, and it just doesn't seem like we're our counterpart is open to that. Yeah, that's and, the and history, I, right? I like that's my understanding. When, that I wasn't correctly. here when this policy got adopted, um, but it does. It, it, it the board at the time, right? It, I think it, the policy reflects the sentiment of the board of the time, of of wanting this to all be open, um, directing the district to open certain parts of it. Um, but it's a two-way street, and Perk is saying that both parties have to agree. Right. And so now, though, going forward, if, if the board directed the district, yes, we, we want this open, transparent bargaining, the union would have to say no, and then we would be behind closed doors, correct? The, the union would have to agree that, yes, we would open things to so the public say, and, that no. and that documents yeah. would be exchanged. Yeah. And if at the initial session the union says, no, we don't want to do that, then we, we don't do it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's too bad. <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, hearing none, we are open for the um, vote. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? No. Ms. Sunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Bronson. Thanks, Bronson. <laughs> All right, and now we're on to uh, policy 5161, civility in the workplace. Okay, so um, the board's priority uh, really um, made me uh, take a look at the WASDA model policy that was recently developed about uh, civility in the workplace. And so, um, this is the opportunity to codify in policy the that board priority and to get really clear um, about you know what the expectations are of stakeholders and in the WASDA model policy just like the board priority it spells out who those stakeholders are including the board um, employees of the district parents volunteers contractors and visitors and so um, the policy says that the board expects all stakeholders to treat each other and students with dignity and respect. It's also kind of reflecting on the conversation at the Superintendent Student Advisory Council today, which was, uh, you know, a lot about um, wanting students to treat each other in the way that is uh, kind of outlined here in the policy and wanting to ensure that um, students and teachers are treating each other this way too. So I just think it's really timely. The policy also clearly identifies what is uncivil conduct. Uh, and um, and it highlights the fact that, you know, uncivil conduct doesn't include the expression of controversial differing viewpoints. You know, this is not about limiting people's free speech or anything like that. Um, it's about, you know, a, a being respectful of one another, uh, respecting each other's dignity and um, you know, when when there are disagreements, doing so in a fashion that doesn't, you know, violate anybody's rights or, um, you know, become uncivil. So this is all verbatim WASDA model policy. Um, and it also provides some guidance to um, everyone in the system for um, addressing uncivil conduct. So if, you know, if people are acting uncivilly, um, these are steps that, uh, people can take and, and that supervisors do have an obligation to um, address uncivil behavior and um, and and try to make things uh, better. We have current policy that outlines for staff um, expectations, but this one gets a little more specific. And, um, <coughs> and it also, the policy just highlights the fact that, you know, if people are on our school campuses and refusing to act civilly or, um, you know, follow the directives of, uh, of supervisors, of building administrators and so forth, when there is uncivil behavior, that they are, you know, subject to um, notice, of, notice of trespass. We can ask them and, and tell, tell them, you know, you can't be on our campuses anymore. So anyway, uh, that's kind of the policy in a nutshell. It's all new policy language, so there's no strike through underline. 
Okay. Anyone would like to uh, make a motion? Move to approve policy 5161, civility in the workplace for first and second reading. I second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second open for discussion. Yes, um, so this is a WASA standard um, and then you you feel the need for this like what's I mean I know you had the meeting today or this week now but but that this was obviously coming before that so like what why did you feel the need to for this because the board identified as a priority um, okay. it's on the it's on your board priorities that you all identified in June and I don't have the wording right in front of me but you saw it on a slide earlier and it shows up on the strategic objectives that um, you want to ensure that we have an environment where there's respectful treatment of all, et cetera, et cetera. So having a having policy language is one step in uh, helping to create that. Now, having a policy doesn't mean, you know, magically now everyone's going to be respectful and so forth, but having policy is really important to have that on the books because it makes a strong statement um, from the board about you know that we're serious about this and provide some real concrete examples and all of that so um i've been working on this because the board identified it as a priority i was actually hoping you were going to say that and that was going to lead me to my next <laughs> question um my next question was so really this is a st allowing us to di potentially discipline better off of a standard it's it's allowing us to set set ground rules so, so that we can take action on those ground rules and discipline better I, I would say um, yes, it provides clarity and specificity about what we mean and what we expect and what the board expects. And then like on the discipline part, you know, there we have a whole bunch of policies around student behavior and things like that. This one is really um, kind of more about the adults in the system, right? It's stakeholders, board of directors, employees, parents, visitors, contractors, et cetera. Uh, not to say students aren't a part of this, but there's also other policy about student behavior expectations. So it's because, you know, but I guess when you're saying discipline, you know, for staff members or something, if people are violating that, yes, absolutely. Or like consequences, natural consequences for people yep. who aren't our employees or aren't our students for. So I like that. that. And then what, I, what I was kind of going with, it was like the bullying type thing mm -hmm. and then and strengthening that whole area is mm -hmm. bullying not treating people with, with respect that kind of thing so um i guess maybe that's a i guess yeah i guess i didn't realize that this was kind of primary i, I see the board of directors employees volunteers contractors um yeah i just kind of want to visit that the other side of it too the yeah. strength of the put teeth in the bullying side mm -hmm. and then put that kind of thing. you know it's interesting because right this is a 5000 series policy so it's in the personnel series even though it also is applying to people you know, non-staff people. Um, but, you know, as we look at reviewing the whole 3000 series this year, which is the student series, we could certainly look at some of the language in this policy to beef up um, okay. any of the student rights responsibilities because we've got those kinds of policies. Um, and some of this language might be helpful on those. Yeah, please take note of that, however. Um, who's who's enforcing this policy and and who's going to be the one to determine some of the subjective I guess language in here right because I look at I'll just use vulgar obscene or profane gesture right not everybody's going to think that you know a cuss word is necessarily they may not view it as that. So who, who's the one that's, I guess, subjectively enforcing this policy? Like say at a football game, you know, obviously you hear people yelling and shouting at the refs, those kind of things. That could be taunting, jeering. So do you kick out all the parents who are hollering at the ref for a bad call? Or so I'm just trying to figure out who's going to enforce mm -hmm. the, these, this policy. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think... I, I think we presently have expectations that people shouldn't be taunting or jeering or swearing at refs and things like that at games. Um, so I think part of this just like 
clarifies what is ex expected. Um, because typically, like in that kind of situation, it's the athletic director or, or the other administrators who are there um, supervising that game that are saying, hey, you know, we can't can't do that. Um, so I, I would say mostly it's it's supervisors and administrators in our system who would be, you know, enforcing uh, this. You know, if um, I think what current practice is, if somebody calls a building or calls here and there's somebody swearing at somebody, you know, they're like the, that person on the other end of the phone who's getting sweared at will say, you know, look, we need to have a civil conversation. You know, I appreciate it if you wouldn't, you know, use that language. Let's calmly, you know, have a conversation. So that's kind of in the addressing uncivil conduct. Part, I think part of it is trying to convey, like, as adults, you know, um, we can we can um, set boundaries, you know, and and politely warn somebody, I guess, who, you know, if, if, if a parent, I'll just say if a parent is yelling and screaming and swearing at a teacher, for example, that teacher has the right to say, I'd appreciate it, you know, if you wouldn't swear at me <laughs> so we can have a conversation. And then it's... And then if that isn't working, then I think that it, the administrator needs to step in, the principal needs to step in and help, um, you know, de-escalate that, that situation and kind of clearly outline for the person, this is what, this is how we need to act. And, and I'm just saying, I think that's what hap that happens now. We just don't have like a policy that lines that all so out. So if that happens now, there's nothing policy-wise that teachers can do like they wouldn't say we need to have a civil conversation. The no, I, wouldn't I, step think, in. I, mean, I think that is that, current right? practice. Yeah. So I, I do think, you, you know, having the policy just sort of like affirms what our current practice is. But there's nothing right now on the books that says it from a board policy. Hey, teachers, here's what you should do if you're to address uncivil conduct, like take these steps, you know. But I think this is probably what's happening for the most part. Any further discussion, concerns? Dave, you like you have a question? Scott, I don't know. No, I just, I just feel like there's some subjectivity to it. I, I think if everybody has the ability to <coughs> define it based on their own subjectivity, I just think it. Well, yeah, I, I, I'll say this uh, from work, from the work experience. If anybody is objected to anything, it needs to be addressed, and that would determine the severity of it. If someone feels objected to, we, I'm speaking solely at work, I can't, I can't go up and say, no, you really weren't, weren't bothered by that. That didn't offend you. It has to be addressed. Sure, but someone could come up and have a conversation with you and maybe share some things and it, it may offend you and they could go to Diane and Micah and share things and it may not offend them. So right. you're, you, you would have a different definition of civility and it would be subjective to your thoughts in your process where it wouldn't be the other so if they spent the entire time talking to diane and micah and sharing the same way and whatever and then all of a sudden they shared with you and then all of a sudden it was like oh no we're now we got this policy and we need to discuss it it just it just feels really subjective to me based on everybody's own opinion of civility yeah just one quick thing just because it's brought to someone else doesn't mean that you're going to get punished because right. of it. That's what I was it's say. discussed and said, okay, uh, as a group or a policy, this is not offensive. We're going to move on from this. But it, like, now, nah, excuse me, I'll try well, that's good. I'm just going to say a couple of things. One, I think that the, the policy um, tries to define uncivil conduct uh, in a kind of a common sense way, right? Like calling people names, using vulgar, disrespectful language, you know, yelling at people, using slurs, um, getting in people's faces, right, getting in their personal space, like that all is like uncivil. And then it, I like this part, and that's why I wanted to highlight it again. It says, uncivil conduct does not include the expression of controversial or differing viewpoints that may be offensive to some persons, so long as the ideas are presented in a respectful manner 
and at a time and place that are appropriate and that such expression doesn't material disrupt and may not be reasonably anticipated to disrupt, et cetera, right? So I could, <clears throat> I could have a very different viewpoint from someone else and calmly and, you know, talk about that different viewpoint. If I'm screaming at them and getting in their face and gesturing and calling names, then, then that would be uncivil conduct. But if I'm expressing my opinion, which is potentially controversial to whoever's on the other end of it, if I'm doing that in a respectful manner, um, then that's not uncivil conduct, according to the policy. All right. And uh, we, we have a motion and a second in discussion. Uh, any more discussion? Seeing none, hearing none, uh, we're going to call for the roll call vote. Mr. Galbraith? No. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. All right. Tracy. I just want to remind, remind Mallory that you can always speak up if you have anything to say in these discussions. Doesn't she get a vote? Didn't we? <laughs> we never got to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, that, that we 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 talk we have talked in the past about having your vote. We we'll discuss that later. Just uh, on that topic real quick, yeah, if I may, um, when Mallory and I met, we did review the board policy um, that um, allows the board to ask for an advisory vote from the student board rep and the board rep to either say yes, no, or abstain. I did say to Mallory, you know, hey, this is your first board meeting, you know, we'll kind of ease into that. I didn't think anything on the, I, I didn't think there's maybe anything on the agenda that would be so that's that's uh that's I, my fault i thought maybe that that might have been a discussion she could have got in a little okay. bit be given the thing today and you can know. always ask questions yeah but that, that's my fault. go for it I'll show you they have that right now though right the advisory vote correct and, and what we said in practice right? is like before the meeting just to give the board rep a heads up i i would moving you know i would say this item on the agenda the board's going to ask for an advisory vote so there's no they're not surprised and this item this item I may I thought since it was our first meeting and I didn't think there's really anything on the agenda, I told her I don't think there's anything for an advisory vote. So that's my fault if the board no, wanted an advisory vote. Well, no, you need a little I was just referring to just I just, I just wanted her to know that she's welcome to make comments at any point yes. in any part of the discussion, at any presentation, so that we that's why you're here. So uh, <coughs> to hear from you. So I just, I just want to just encourage you to go for it. So let's, let's yell at Ron, yell at Ron. Yeah, please do. <laughs> uh, how about the, uh, I'm sorry, I don't, the alternate, the. Annie. Yeah, the, the person the, that's coming in. That's the Annie. representative Annie. elect. Annie. Yeah, <laughs> do, do she also have a, can she ask? Okay, that's no, she, she's, she's a, just a, she's a silent learner. She said yeah. no. So, so all year she just come in? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think they can talk beforehand if there's questions Before that they okay. have. I think they can have like a little. Sound if you want to do sign language, we can. <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. Gavel. All right. Next meeting agenda. Uh, on the next meeting agenda, we have study session. So we're here earlier, right? Is that that's the day we're here at uh, four, four, four to five p.m. Four to study five. session. Four to five p.m. And then uh, also on the agenda is family, parent involvement, and engagement efforts. And I'd like to propose something else that's a little controversial. And that's, uh, you know how they, they have ID passes, have badges? Is it possible, is it an intrusion? And I guess I want to, the legal did he leave? Anyway, is it an intrusion on students' rights if they have RFID? Uh, capabilities on those badges so that we know when the kids go into school, we know when they come out, it's all captured on the badge. Oh, and then have the mechanism in the building to read out. We don't um, have to answer yeah, now, do but if we can put that on. that on the agenda. Yeah. That'd be, yeah, that'd be, that'd be, that'd be a good discussion, Ron. Okay. All right. So uh, we will now move into executive session uh, as 
estimated to last about 30 minutes. At the end of that session, I'll come back out and uh, close down the meeting by uh, uh, hitting the gavel very hard. And that will be the when we adjourn. So we're not adjourned now. We're going to executive session. OK, so if you guys want to hang out for 30, 40 minutes. Oh, I can I can only say 30 minutes. Yeah. So you could let them know there's no there further, will be no business. further. Yeah, there's no further business tonight. There is no okay. further business.